In 1544, the 23rd year of the Jiajing Emperor's reign during the Ming Dynasty, a Portuguese merchant fleet was sailing to Japan. As they passed through the Taiwan Strait, they sighted an island off the Chinese mainland. They called it Ila Formosa, Beautiful Island. Taiwan lies between the East China and South China Seas, with the Pacific Ocean to its east. To the west is Fujian Province, a mere 130 kilometers away at its closest point. Roughly oblong and oriented north to south, Taiwan covers 36,000 square kilometers. The Qing Dynasty saw it as both the gateway to southeast China and a barrier shielding several provinces. Archaeology reveals the antiquity of human culture on Taiwan. Anthropological and cultural connections between Taiwan and Fujian can be traced back to the late Paleolithic. Fossil fragments of a human skull dating to between 20 and 30,000 years ago have been discovered in Tainan County. Objects from the late Paleolithic found in Baxian Cave in the village of Changbin in Taidung County have been dated to between five and 15,000 years ago, or even earlier. It is noteworthy that human fossils found at Zhuojun and Changbin on Taiwan are essentially the same in their morphology as those found at Qingleo, Zhangzhou and Dungshan in Fujian province. Both groups inherited characteristics from Homo erectus in China, and so share a common origin. Hindu 中国大陆 Documentary evidence shows that travel between Taiwan and the Chinese mainland began in the Han Dynasty. At times, residents on the mainland displaced by civil unrest migrated to Taiwan, seeking a new life. Merchants crossed the strait to trade. In the second half of the 11th century, this relationship became especially strong in terms of trade, politics, and culture. The Northern Sung paid increasing attention to Taiwan and its administrative involvement there. The Southern Sung set up military posts in the Pengu Islands. In 1171, the governor of Quanzhou, Wang Daiyo, built 200 dwellings on the islands and posted troops there. The islands were administered by Jinjiang County in Fujian. During the late 1330s, the Yuan Dynasty established a constabulary in the Pengu Islands. The Taiwan region was now officially under the administrative jurisdiction of the Central Plains-based Empire. Once global maritime routes were opened, Western nations extended their colonial and commercial efforts in the Orient. China was one of their ultimate objectives. In the early 17th century, the Dutch became involved. But the Ming Dynasty's ill-conceived military strategies compromised naval defense along the southeastern coast. 
Sheer incompetence then gave Western colonialists their chance. Between 1604 and 1622, the Dutch East India Company twice sent ships into the Pengu Islands. It built a fortress there and demanded the right to trade from the administrators in Fujian. It also took to raiding the coast of the mainland. Unsettled by this, the Ming court sent Admiral Shen Yurong, the scourge of pirates, to expel the Dutch. Shin sailed to the Pengu Islands with a large fleet of warships and met the Dutch Admiral Vibrand van Waerwijk. Ordering the Dutch to leave at once, he recovered this Chinese territory without firing a shot. In commemoration, the locals erected Taiwan's first stele, inscribed, Shen Yurong expelled with stern orders the auburn-haired foreigners, van Waerwijk and the others. Uh in 1624, the Dutch established themselves in Taiwan, where the city of Tainan is today. They built two forts, Fort Zelandia and Fort Provindia, and expanded to the east and the north. Two years later, the Spanish occupied northern Taiwan and expanded their presence as well. 後來荷蘭人知道說說 once they had defeated the Spanish, the Dutch occupied the whole of Taiwan. During the Dutch occupation, the average annual return to the Netherlands from Taiwan was equivalent to four tons of gold. As even the first Dutch governor, Martinus Zunk, admitted, the measures adopted against the Chinese were ruthless and cruel. The tyranny of the foreign invaders caused the people in Taiwan tremendous anguish. This strengthened the Chinese nation's resolve to reclaim what it had lost. The people in Taiwan stood up courageously against Dutch rule in wave after wave of resistance. Coincidentally, in 1624, the year the Dutch occupied Taiwan, a hero of the Chinese nation was born. His name was Jung Chung Gung. Zaiming 整个这个对外这个这个贸易的这个整个网络都掌控在郑子龙手上 Jung Chung Gung's father, Jung Jilong, was a follower of the pirate Yen Si Chi. 
They landed at Port Ponkan in Taiwan and later built a stronghold at Tirosen. While seeking land fit for farming, they also engaged in piracy and smuggling along the Fujian coast. As Zheng Zhilong grew in power, he encouraged his fellow Fujianese villagers to settle in Taiwan. Jing Zhilong was an official, a merchant, and a pirate. He had high hopes for his son and wanted him to study hard and become a great man. Jing Chunggung was born in Japan to a Japanese mother. He was both very studious and passionate about perfecting his martial arts skills. His ambition to serve his nation in the military arose from that passion. At the age of seven, Jing Chunggun came home to Angping in Fujian, where his father had settled. He lived next to Shi Jing Academy and was raised with strong Confucian values, strengthening his steadfast loyalty to the empire. However, his life took a dramatic turn amid the tumultuous demise of the Ming Dynasty and the foundation of the Qing. Introduced Introduced by his father, the young man was received by the Longwu Emperor of the Southern Ming. Longwu approved of him, granting him his own surname, Zhu, as an honor. Henceforth, he was known as the Lord of the Imperial Surname, or as Koshinga. Soon afterwards, Zheng Zhilong accepted an amnesty from the Qing court. Zheng Chenggong fiercely opposed this, but his tearful pleas fell on deaf ears, so he decided to break with his father. Tragically, as Zheng Zhilong and his men were defecting to Qing, the Qing army invaded Anping. His wife, Tagawa Matsa, committed suicide to escape dishonor. Deeply traumatized by these misfortunes, Zheng Chenggong began contemplating his purpose in life. Faced with the nation's ruin, and after much internal struggle, Zheng Chenggong refused to be persuaded by his father and the Qing court. He expressed his quandary in verse. Heaven set as my formidable mission to resist the enemy with all my might. But to choose between loyalty to the nation and duty to my father is a dilemma that brings me to tears. <laughs> 父亲想清了母亲肆意肆意念了
While making offerings at the Confucian temple, he also wrote these words. Once a child, but now your fatherless servant. Whatever I do, I must do good. My studies now end. I take up arms, hoping Confucius will understand. He vowed to resist the Qing and attempt to restore the Ming. Early in 1647, Zheng Chenggong launched his resistance campaign. Many responded to his call, and his armed forces grew rapidly. Basing his troops in Xiamen and Jinmen, he called himself Generalissimo of the Counteroffensive. His struggle against the Qing army had begun. In November 1646, Zhang Huangyan, the Prince of Gui, had proclaimed himself emperor with the era name Yongli, thereby founding another southern Ming regime. Zheng Chunggung now upheld its legitimacy. For his part, the Yongli emperor conferred on Zheng Chunggung several honorary titles between 1648 and 1657, including Prince of Yanping. The Qing court viewed Zheng Chenggong's growing resistance movement as a significant threat. After military action and the enforcement of strict embargoes failed to stop Zheng Chenggong, the Qing resorted to bribery and attempts to recruit him. However, Zheng Chenggong stood firm in resisting them. Zheng Chenggong was in the middle of the Qing court, there were 500 people. Sanwandor的比例就在这里闽安镇这一带闽江口下游跟这个新港口这个两岸特别是在这个镇野壁这个地方这个长期在这里训练他这个把闽安镇作为缓清枯民的战略基地镇镇公进攻江苏南京给
Then his fleet weighed anchor in Liao Luo Bay, Jinmen Island. Guided by Her Bin, Jin Chenggong's army arrived off Port Luomen a month later. Ships could enter the port via a northern channel, but it was winding and shallow, allowing passage to only one vessel at a time. So the Dutch did not think it necessary to mount a guard. The waterway beneath Fort Zeelandia was deep and wide enough to accommodate large ships but it was covered by the heavy cannons of the Dutch. So Jung Chung-gung chose to risk taking the shallow northern channel. He knew from experience that there were usually king tides between the third and fourth lunar months, so he took his chances and sailed through on such a king tide. With the assistance of the local people, the fleet succeeded in making landfall in Taiwan. Jun Chung-gung immediately engaged the Dutch. Concurrently, he wrote to them, stressing that Taiwan was Chinese territory and that they must return it unconditionally. However, the Dutch colonists refused to give up without a fight. Jun Chung-gung launched a frontal assault and seized Fort Provindia. Next, he besieged the Dutch administrative center, Tai Yuen, as the Dutch called it. The colonists summoned a reinforcement force of 700 men from Batavia, present-day Jakarta in Indonesia. This force reached Taiwan Strait on the 12th of September, and a major battle ensued. Jin Chung-gung's men fought bravely, burning the Dutch flagship Kotoruf with fireboats and sinking their warship Kaldikerka with gunfire. They also captured three small vessels. The defeated Dutch fleet returned to Batavia and did not venture near Taiwan again. After the failure of the relief effort, the Dutch colonists remained under siege in Taiyuan. After nine months, they had no choice but to surrender. During the treaty negotiations, the Dutch still coveted the beautiful and well-resourced island and made various attempts to stay in Taiwan. However, Jung Chung-kung remained adamant. Taiwan was Chinese territory. The Dutch must leave. On the 1st of February, 1662, the treaty between Koxinga and the Dutch government was signed at the city revenue office in Taiyuan, present-day Anping district in Tainan. Baodao, the abundant island, returned to the Chinese after 38 years of Dutch colonial occupation. Jing Chung-gung went down in Chinese history as a national hero. Taiwan became the long-term base for his campaigns against the Qing. He started building infrastructure on the island to help further his goal to restore the Ming. He also established an administrative system in Taiwan that mirrored that of the Chinese mainland, laying a firm foundation for the future governance of Taiwan. 
郑成功他第一次把就是我们中国的这样郡县制度，他当时收复台湾就是去呃收复台湾的时候，在一九六一年一六六一年，他当时就在台湾设立了一府两县。这个是中国政权在那儿设立的最早的行政建制。郑成功也确实是把台湾当做一个说一个一个长远要发展的一个一个一个地方来建设的。首先，他解决了自己军队的这样一些粮饷供应的一些问题，他就已经开始把军队分布到各地南北各地去开始屯垦了，就是说去开发土地，去农业生产的建设，建孔庙，然后建了学校。所以在中国传统文化在台湾的传播，我觉得说就是郑成功收复台湾之后是。打下了一个很好的基础，就真正中国传统文化的种子，在那以后就发展起来了。In order to improve the level of education of the people in Taiwan and to reverse the effects of Dutch colonial education, Jing Chunggong devoted much energy to promoting cultural education in Taiwan. This flourishing of cultural education helped to strengthen the linkage between Taiwan and the Chinese mainland in terms of their shared roots, culture, and ethnicity. However, on the 23rd of June, 1662, just as his tremendous efforts were beginning to bear fruit, Zheng Chunggong died. Zheng Zhengong in the Taiwan Taiwan So he worked very hard. 这个我们明朝基本上相同的这样一个跟清朝相对峙的这样一个一个区域吧。His son Zheng Jing now assumed control of Taiwan. In 1664, Zheng Jing launched initiatives to develop Taiwan. The military advisor Chen Yonghua devised a multifaceted strategy: ten years growth, ten years education, ten years consolidation, to equal the Central Plains in 30 years. Taiwan developed in leaps and bounds, seeing economic, educational, and administrative improvements. Its development was explosive. In terms of cultural development in Taiwan, the Confucian scholar Shen Guangwen was a literary pioneer. He wrote traditional poems, the first such works on the island, and is regarded as the founder of literature in Taiwan. During the revolt of the three feudatories between 1673 and 1681, Jing Jing thought that the time to overthrow the Qing had arrived. In 1674, he led his armies on a campaign westward, but suffered a great defeat. Zheng Jing, when he was attacking the Qing, was mainly a big procession, which was the Yuan Qing procession, which was the most popular procession. The Yuan Qing was very popular. The Yuan Qing was very popular. 广东这边有那个有有有上科喜汤，就是上上家的，然后福建有耿金忠，他早期在福建的时候，他是跟耿金忠他们是是联合的，后来因为各自的一些利益的一些争端，后面就逐渐的，然其他的三藩势力很快就被清军慢慢的瓦解了，所以说后面就变成他自己的一股势力，但他自己面自己一股势力去面对比较强大清军的时候，他当然后面就也就是就是失败的会比较快一些这样。After this, his regime adopted a stance of passive defense. Jing Jing no longer aspired to restore the Ming. In lieu of his duties, he turned to debauchery. Having overindulged for some years, Jing Jing died of a stroke in 1681. Over the subsequent three years, power struggles compounded by droughts, floods, and fires 
precipitated sharp economic decline. The people struggled. Taiwan's future became uncertain. The Qing court had kept a close watch on the Jung regime in Taiwan and along the coast of the mainland. It offered incentives to recruit the Jung leadership, even as it engaged in military actions against them. In late 1664, Admiral She Lung, who had defected to the Qing, was ordered to lead a military campaign to Taiwan, together with Zhou Chuenbin and other defectors who had served in Zheng Jilong's navy. Two attempts were foiled by typhoons. The Qing court then became suspicious of She Lung. In 1668, he was relieved of his post and called to Beijing to serve in the Imperial Guards. Qingjungfu 郑成功抗清福建水师提督 The Admiral of the Fujian Navy played a pivotal role in the success of the mission to reclaim Taiwan. The Kangxi Emperor had to think carefully when appointing a suitable person to the position. Two things were required of the right candidate. He needed to be well versed in naval affairs and experienced in commanding naval battles, and he had to be knowledgeable about the Zheng regime. Shi Lung was among those being considered. In 1681, the Kangxi Emperor ordered the governor of Fujian, Yao Qisheng, to collaborate on a plan to recapture the Pengu Islands. On the strong recommendation of Li Guangdi and Yao Qisheng, Shi Lung was reappointed Admiral of the Fujian Navy. He took up his post in Xiamen and prepared for the new expedition. Late in 1682, Shi Lung and his 30,000 naval men were training in Pinghai. A drought befell them, resulting in a severe shortage of drinking water. Shi Lung ordered his men to unblock an abandoned well found behind a temple of the sea goddess Matsu. The spring water released was both refreshing and plentiful. Taking this as a gift from Matsu, Shi Lung erected a monument, naming the well Naval Spring. On the 14th of June, 1683, Shi Lung and his force of 30,000 men set out from Port Tongshen. The fleet of 300 warships headed straight to the Pengu Islands, the gateway to Taiwan. The previous May, the Jung regime's naval commander, Liu Guoxian, had stationed a group of more than 20,000 well-trained soldiers in the Pengu Islands. Security was heightened at every place where Qing troops might land. In all, 14 cannon stations were set up along 10 or so kilometers of the coastline. The Sentinels were on high alert, vowing both to defend the territory and to defeat the enemy invaders. Shi Lung captured the weakly defended Ba Zhao Island. The Qing now had an anchorage for their vessels, 
and a base from which to launch offensives against the Pengu Islands. Xi Lung's knowledge of weather and the tides allowed the Qing Navy to launch a frontal assault on the Zheng troops. After heavy fighting, the Qing triumphed. The Zheng lost 194 warships and some 15,000 men. Another 4,800 defected to the Qing. The defeated Liu Guoxuan and 300 of his men limped back to Taiwan via the unguarded Homen waterway between Baisha and Xiyu Islands. It seemed that a peaceful resolution to the conflict might now be possible. Qing forces pressed further against the Zheng regime. On the 18th of the intercalary month after June, news of the victory reached Beijing. The Kangxi Emperor was elated, saying that the Pengu Islands were the gateway to retaking Taiwan. But he insisted on winning over the Zheng leadership by persuasion. He ordered Xie Lung to set aside the long-held grudge between the Zheng and the Xie clans and to put the nation's interests first. Xie Lung immediately ordered a ceasefire and took steps to work towards a peaceful resolution of the situation. Xie Lung published messages of consolation and empathy towards the Pengu Island's residents. He also ensured that prisoners of war were treated decently. Soon after the war ended, the people of the islands truly felt that peace had come. When Xie Lung arrived in the Pengu Islands, he forbade his soldiers to kill or loot. This created a favorable impression in Taiwan. He also negotiated with the Zheng regime, finally persuading the local ruler Zheng Keshuang to pledge submission to the Qing dynasty. Xie Lung and his men landed in Taiwan to handle a few remaining matters. On the 3rd of October, a solemn ceremony was held in the Confucian temple to accept the Zheng regime's surrender. This marked the end to decades of anti-Qing struggles by Ming loyalists. Zhu Shougui, the Ming prince of Ningjing, had settled in Taiwan. When he heard of the surrender, he realized that all hopes of reviving his dynasty had been dashed. He and his five concubines committed suicide. In their memory, the temple of the five concubines was built at the place where they were buried. Following Xie Lung's conquest of the Pengu Islands, Qing officials held conflicting views about what next to do with Taiwan. However, Xie Lung was well aware that retaining or relinquishing Taiwan would affect China's long-term security. He earnestly advocated its importance to the emperor. The emperor weighed the matter for eight months. In 1684, he decided to include Taiwan in the territory of the great Qing Empire. The Qing set up one prefecture and three counties in Taiwan, which sat under the jurisdiction of Fujian province. They also revoked the prohibition on sea travel from the southeastern coastal areas. People on both sides of the strait could now travel freely. With the Qing's reunification of Taiwan and the Chinese mainland, Taiwan's development took a new trajectory. News of Taiwan's reclamation reached Beijing on the day of the Mid-Autumn Festival. In response, the Kangxi Emperor wrote an exuberant poem. The war in distant Taiwan has ended. Our navy has reclaimed the island. A vassal comes not to the court to discuss virtues. Subjugation cannot be accomplished by force alone. The commander accepted their surrender in autumn. The Imperial Guards received the news on a moonlit night. The people on the island have long endured conflict. Now, reunited, all can live in peace. Taiwan, that island of great abundance off the mainland, was finally reunited with China. Despite having endured many ordeals, 
Taiwan and the Chinese mainland are related by close ties which cannot be severed. Achieving reunification is the common desire of people on both sides of the Taiwan Strait. Jung Chung-gung reclaimed Taiwan. She Lang reunified Taiwan. History will not forget those who made great contributions to achieve the reunification of Taiwan. Sea and sky form a single scene. Honor and disgrace comprise a reputation. The twists and turns of Taiwan's history serve as a reminder that Taiwan and the mainland are connected by blood through thick and thin.